So now it's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce our second guest speaker for today, uh, Rolf Ahark. Rolf is a professor and associate director of the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine. He has received many awards and accolades for his work on glioma and tumor evolution. I'm looking forward to his uh, presentation entitled Dissecting Response to Treatment in Adult Patients with a Glioma. Rolf? Well, uh, Bjorn and Ensian, thank you so very much for inviting me uh, to speak at this conference. It's great um, to see how many people have uh, are attending this meeting, and it's because of the fantastic program that uh, you guys have put together. Um, initially, I was going to talk about extrachromosomal DNA amplifications. Uh, Bjorn and I have actually talked about those in the past. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I think it's very interesting. But I had a late change in heart and switched over to a topic that's more focused on brain tumors. Um, so there may have been an earlier version of the program about extrachromosomal DNA, but as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm gonna talk entirely about brain tumors instead. In particular, uh, addressing some of the, the results we've uh, obtained um, with respect to response to treatment and, and uh, ideas of how we could improve that. So I am a co-founder of Boundless Bio, although that has no implications to today's um, uh, presentation. So the genomic landscape of adult glioma, of primary untreated adult glioma and glioblastoma has been very well characterized by the Cancer Genome Atlas, but also many other groups. Uh, Russ Pieper earlier mentioned the efforts by um, Bob Jenkins and Margaret Wrench and others in that uh, context. Um, and from this work, we've learned uh, um, what are expression subtypes. We've identified the most commonly mutated genes and the most commonly amplified and deleted genes in, in for example, glioblastoma or glioma, um, with the third promoter mutation being by far the most frequent, um, followed by things like EGFR amplification um, and CDK N2A deletion. Uh, this work, these, uh, these characterization initiatives have not yet led to a real improvement in uh, treatment outcomes. Although it did teach us that there's better ways of stratifying uh, glioma in adult patients, uh, particularly highlighted in those two back-to-back -back papers, one by the UCSF Mayo Group and one by the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, and so from here on out, from, from about 2015 forward, uh, we've started to, to group uh, adult glioma, not so much by histology, but rather by uh, 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 subtypes based on two molecular markers, namely IDH mutation, and uh, 1P90Q code deletion. And what I wanna specify here is that not only do these three molecular subtypes differ strongly in patient outcomes, but also in the biology as reflected by the sets of, of um, somatic events that take place in each of the three groups. For example, the 1P90Q code L group, which is predominantly oligodendric gliomas, um, contains many mutations in genes such as CIC and FUBP1, which are pretty rare in any of the, in, in the other two subtypes. Um, ATRX and P53 events are highly frequent in non-codels, which are predominantly astrocytomas. And then finally, IDH wild type group. The IDH wild type group, which is really a glioblastoma group, is IDH negative, uh, contains quite a number of P53 mutations, as well as EGFR amplifications, P10, and so forth. So there's not just a clinical basis for these, these three groups, but also a bi biological uh, rationale. Now, cancer derives from normal cells and through an evolutionary process. Our knowledge so far is entirely based on untreated tumors at diagnosis. But the, but the cancer doesn't stop evolving there. This was actually beautifully shown in a talk we just had from, uh, from Joe and Nancy Ann, as hypermutation is a, is a reflection of an evolving tumor. A subclone that acquires the hypermutation phenotype uh, is able to outcompete other cells, and thereby the tumor recurrence is predominantly existing of uh, cells with this hypermutation um, uh, uh, representation. Um, so treatment can, it can, uh, can create evolutionary bottlenecks that result in a, a different tumor post-treatment. Similar evolutionary bottlenecks in, GB, in glioma um, are, are things like hypoxia, um, radiation creates its own evolutionary bottleneck, and of course actually surgery is an evolutionary bottleneck in itself too. Motivated by the positive momentum we had from the Cancer Genome Atlas, 
um, but also by a recognition of many groups in the field that we needed to understand the evolutionary patterns of glioma beyond just characterizing untreated tumors. We initiated a consortium in 2015, which we called the Glioma Longitudinal Analysis or GLASS Consortium. The purpose of this consortium is to create a molecular map of glioma evolution to generate a comprehensive molecular reference data set similar to TCGA, uh, broadly accessible, but now from pairs of primary and recurrent glioma with clinical annotation. And of course, the clinical annotation is essential here because an important goal of the GLASS consortium is to understand what the impact is of treatment on the genomic makeup of these gliomas. And this picture was taken um, in one of the first face-to-face -face meetings we had with the, with the GLASS consortium. Um, and of course, I can point out uh, Joe Costello right there, and we have uh, enjoyed much, much uh, involvement of the UCSF group in GLASS. In November of 2019, so a little bit more than a year ago, the GLASS consortium released its first data resource publicly. <clears throat> it's available on the URL that's being shown here. So you can go to this URL and obtain the, the uh, predominantly DNA sequencing data of the cohort that's described in this table. The GLASS consortium, uh, the GLASS uh, data resource uh, captures uh, exome and whole genome data from over 220 patients with high quality data and actually a large, larger set, um, but of the additional 60 or so patients, not all data is, as, is, a, is of optimal quality. <coughs> Excuse me. In this cohort of 222 uh, patients with high quality data, over half are IDH wild type tumors. Uh, uh, another 40 or so percent are IDH mutant non-codels, and then the final 10% is made up of IDH mutant codels. The logistical challenge to obtain uh, tumors at multiple, over multiple time points was a strong incentive to create the GLASS consortium since uh, this makes it very challenging for in individual institutions to get to large cohort sizes. That same logistical challenge is somewhat represented here as uh, IDH mutant codels typically have a longer time to recurrence and therefore are thus just logistically harder to obtain. So we see a bit of an unbalance there. Um, However, in current GLASS efforts, uh, uh, we're trying to, uh, to address that by increasing our efforts, our, our work in obtaining IDH mutant codel tumors. However, in the, co in the cohort that I'll describe a few uh, results from today, this is, this is the, the, their representation. Um, the patients in general are a little bit younger than what you would see in the typical um, uh, population uh, as um, uh, uh, so nicely uh, pulled together by CBT or uh, US. Um, so the patients are a little bit younger and this could be due to the fact that uh, the patient needs to be able to undergo multiple surgeries or surgical procedures uh, to obtain the samples from which we can then do molecular characterization. That also implies that the outcomes for these for our code are a little bit better than what you would typically see and that's shown here. This also reflects that we actually do have a pretty complete clinical data. Another aspect of clinical data we have is whether the patients received temozolomide in between their tumor occurrences. Um, of course, the vast majority of IDH wild type uh, patients receive temozolomide, um, and nearly half of the mutants, uh, in addition, um, receive temozolomide. And just building on what uh, Joe and Nancy Hans just showed you, this is a mutation frequency very similar to what was shown. Um, the, uh, the uh, brownish dots in these, uh, uh, in these figures at the top represent the mutation frequency at diagnosis and the greenish dots represent mutation frequency in that same tumor at recurrence. And you can very clearly see that we see a hypermutation subgroup in each of the three uh, molecular subtypes. Um, and the frequencies are actually comparable to what Nancy Ann showed uh, perhaps with the exception of the IDH mutant codel group, but that's such a small group of which we have um, temozolomide treated cases that that's probably a sampling bias. And this result was described in the first GLASS consortium paper, which was uh, uh, auth first authors were uh, Flores Bartel and Kevin Johnson. And I know the UCSF group has recently, recently heard about this from, from Flores as well. Um, when we compared uh, survival behavior or survival patterns, um, 
and we focused on the IDH mutant non codal group because it has the largest number of cases uh, where we can distinguish hypermutators and non hypermutators. Uh, we don't really, we don't see a significant difference in the time to recurrence and the time it took for the tumor to progress and, and um, uh, to motivate the surgeon to take it out again. Um, however, in line with the grade increase that Nancy Ann described, uh, we do indeed see a post-recurrence decrease in survival for hypermutators versus non-hypermutators. Now this work <clears throat> was published the glass consortium is published, but I'm happy to, uh, to, to say that the rest of this uh, uh, presentation will all be unpublished data. Um, another uh, treatment modality in, for uh, uh, patients, adult patients with the glioma is, of course, uh, ionizing radiation. Now, ionizing radiation has been around for decades, and we have a broad understanding of what it does to, to the genomes of cells. Um, it creates uh, single strand breaks as well as double strand breaks, which each have individual or separate, I should say, uh, repair mechanisms. And these repair mechanisms aren't always perfect. For that reason, may uh, a, a treated cell, a, a cell treated with radiation therapy, may acquire DNA damage that we can detect via uh, sequencing. In the glass cohort, we have. Uh, patients that received radiation therapy. We have patients that did not receive uh, radiation, uh, radiation therapy. And, and then we have a handful of cases for which we lack the appropriate annotation. But as you see in the numbers here, we should be able to make uh, a pretty good comparisons with, um, to determine what the effect of radiation therapy on the tumor actually is. So we use the glass data to, uh, to evaluate um, uh, DNA damage, uh, among others, along three categories of DNA damage. The most left column here, or figure here, is showing the frequency of small deletions. These are two to 20 base pair deletions uh, that may uh, lead to inappropriate protein products um, or have other, otherwise implications. And as you can see, we see a significant increase in, the num in cases treated with the radiation therapy uh, in small deletion frequency, and we do not see a significant increase in uh, cases not treated with radiation therapy. When we evaluated uh, a similar, when we made a similar evaluation of the number of small insertions, so two to twenty base pair or nucleotide insertions, we do not see a difference, nor do we find a difference in uh, the number of single nucleotide variants, uh, which is of course what what tenozolomide is doing to hypermutated tumors. So. Ionizing radiation causes an increase in small deletions, but not other types of small, uh, small variants. Um, that's reminiscent of uh, the effect of uh, uh, temozolomide induced hypermutation. Um, interestingly, we also, we, uh, because of course we have complete, uh, uh, relatively complete treatment info, we can also look at the effect of temozolomide. And indeed, temozolomide separate, uh, temozolomide, uh, um, driven hypermutators also increase their small deletion burden. So, hyper, so temozolomide has its own way of increasing small deletion burden, apparently. But the effect we're seeing is clearly independent of temozolomide. So we see an increase in small deletion burden in cases treated with, with temozolomide, cases not treated with temozolomide, and also hypermutators separately from non-hypermutators, as shown in this multivariate analysis. So we clearly identify radiation therapy as a driver of the number of small mutations in glioma. We evaluated whether there were biomarkers maybe similar to NGMT methylation for hypermutation, either at recurrence or at, at uh, after, uh, either at diagnosis or at recurrence. And the most prominent biomarker we could find was, was the presence of a uh, homozygous deletion of the CDKN to a uh, tumor suppressor. So only in cases treated with radiation, we find CDKN to a homozygous deletion at recurrence, and that almost always coincided with an increase in the number of small deletions. So CDKN to a homozygous deletion among IDH mutant gliomas is a biomarker for uh, a radiation effect, if you will. 
And then finally, um, we evaluated uh, a survival and observed that um, overall survival is worse. Uh, I, oh, I, lacked, I forgot to include the colors of the, the Kaplan-Meier curve here. We see that cases where we see an increase in small deletion burden have worse outcomes than cases that do not show a post-radiation increase in small deletion burden. Um, when we looked into more in, in more detail, as I just showed you for hyper mutation as well, the surgical interval is actually not significantly different. It's entirely due to the worst uh, post-recurrence outcomes. So we speculate that um, hyper that uh, a small deletion uh, burden increase post radiation um, is a reflection of lack of, uh, lack of sensitivity to radiation after that. So. Uh, as GLASS is progressing, we are gearing up to releasing our second data resource. As a matter of fact, that second data resource has already been released to the consortium, and we have a 12-month moratorium before we release it publicly. Um, the second data resource was released inside the consortium in November of 2020, which means that it will be released publicly in November of 2021. Um, in this second release, we haven't much we haven't focused as much on increasing the number of patients in our cohort, but instead have focused on increasing the orthogonal data sets. And uh, we have thus um, been able to establish a large number of parallel RNA sequencing data sets, um, as well as DNA methylation uh, data sets. And you can see the overlap between those uh, um, sets here. I'm just going to give you some teaser results uh, because we're still in the midst of analyzing the data, um, but I wanted, did want to highlight this upcoming release. Um, as you may know, glioblastoma, IDH wild type glioblastoma can be grouped into multiple expression subtypes. They're labeled mesenchymal, proneural, and classical. And each of these subtypes uh, is characterized by relatively unique uh, somatic alterations, such as uh, NF1 mutations and deletions in the mesenchymal group, um, EGFR amplifications in the classical group and PDGFRA and CDK4 amplifications in the proneural group. We use the GLASS data to look at a gene expression subtype transitions over time. Um, the proneural to mesenchymal switch has often been referred to uh, in the literature. Um, and indeed, we do see that this happens. We do see cases that switch uh, from uh, a primary proneural tumor to a mesenchymal tumor at recurrence. However, as you can hopefully appreciate from this uh, Sankey plot, uh, this is not the most common uh, subtype change. In fact, uh, about 55% of IDH wild type tumors maintain their gene expression subtype. Um, and of the 45% of that switch, the most common switch is actually classical to mesenchymal. So we do see a, a small increase in the number of mesenchymal uh, cases at recurrence, and this is true for both IDH wild type and IDH mutant tumors. But maybe more prominently, we see a decrease in the number of classical tumors. But to conclude this first part, GLASS is a community effort uh, with much part participation of UC UCSF um, to provide a longitudinal molecular reference of glioma and our second release will become public in November. We measure relevant genomic changes after recurrence in about half of gliomas. This is hypermutation. Uh, we're adding to the small deletion frequency increase after radiation, which I think is in concept and, and, and actual consequence, very similar to hypermutation. Um, uh, and we also see uh, a radiotherapy uh, associated acquired CDKN28 deletions as well as aneuploidy. And I didn't talk about the aneuploidy. You'll have to wait until the publication comes out to see that. It means that another half of glioma tumors appears to be largely unchanged in response to therapy. This suggests an intrinsic resistance. How do recurrent glioma become more aggressive? Are these mechanisms not genomic or cellular? To address those questions, uh, we in the lab um, started a single cell profiling effort also because if you don't do single cell profiling these days, uh, you're clearly uh, not current anymore. Um, but also because, of course, single cell profiling is really showing there's new barriers, new boundaries um, of, uh, of, uh, and, and new insights into uh, tumor development. We did single cell profiling using the 10x platform on 11 tumors. 
both IDH mutants and IDH wild types. Uh, also both uh, primary and recurrent tumors, but not matched uh, primary recurrences. Within these uh, 11 gliomas, uh, we profiled about 55,000 uh, cells, single cells. And in this UMAP figure on the left, uh, from this UMAP plot on the left, we inferred three panglioma cell states. There's been lots of cell states that have been reported by now of glioma. Um, what sets these three apart is that they're panglioma. We find some of the cells of the stem-like cells, the proliferating stem-like cells, and the differentiated stem-like cells across all 11 tumors. So the 11 tumors are shown here on the right. And in um, at these plots, you can see the rough distribution, the approximate distribution of the stem-like, uh, of the panglioma cell states. And you may appreciate the uh, higher frequency of, um, of the, the stem-like cells among the IDH mutants and the higher frequency of differentiated like cells uh, among the uh, IDH wild types. Just to compare and contrast, so we, uh, Mario Sufa's group um, has been very productive in releasing cell states and insights in what these cell states mean. So we compared this, the, the three panglioma states to what Mario reported. Um, and there's large convergence, for example, the uh, prominent diff-like group that we are seeing mostly overlaps with the mesenchymal and the astrocyte-like group that uh, Mario recently reported. Now, in parallel to our uh, single cell um, gene expression profiling, we performed single cell DNA methylation profiling on these same tumors. And the single cell methylation profiles were not obtained from the exact same cells, but we did homogenize the tumor sample before creating the library. So the, the cells are not from different specimens, they're from the same specimen after homo homogenization. Um, we used a reduced representation by sulfate sequencing. Uh, so you get a set of, C you get methylation status of a set of CPGs from each single cell that is usually not overlapping. Uh, but through computational techniques, we can still do, uh, com make comparisons between individual cells. What you can see in the plot here on the right, uh, these are the uh, 850 or the 900 or 850 or so uh, single cell uh, methylomes. And as expected, uh, single cell single cells from IDH mutant tumors uh, cluster separately from IDH wild type tumors. And we see uh, uh, interspersing of single cells from different cases and whereas some other cases uh, seem to cluster by themselves. Now there's a lot we can do with these data. I wanna highlight one aspect of the analysis we then uh, performed, which is to look at ordered DNA methylation versus disordered DNA methylation or epimutation. Within domains, methylation is often congruent. You'll find that adjacent uh, CPG sites have the same methylation status. However, as an effect of, for example, tumor genesis, that methylation may become uh, disordered, which means that adjacent CPGs now no longer have the same methylation status. And this is what we started to refer to as an epimutation. We measured epimutation rate in our, 11, in our code of 11 cases, and we find a higher epimutation burden uh, among IDH wild type tumors compared to IDH mutants. Perhaps expected because the frequency of, for example, point mutations is also higher in IDH wild type cases compared to mutants. Um, when we evaluated uh, genes with where promoters had a higher epimutation burden versus genes where the promoters had lower epimutation burden, we see some patterns emerge. For example, uh, genes in, uh, evol involved in differentiation processes accumulated more epimutation, whereas metabolism genes uh, acquired fewer um, epimutations, suggesting that there's more control of uh, epigenetic integrity among the latter set of genes. We also evaluated binding sites of transcription factors, uh, looking for rates of epimutation among sets of binding sites. And when we did so, we identified a number of transcription, transcription factors where the epimutation rate was more pronounced. And uh, you might notice that, uh, that we, that is the case for the, for both in both IDT mutant gliomas in purple, as well as in um, 
for IDH wild type gliomas in green, suggesting that this is not a random effect. Um, and we then noticed that for some of these um, uh, transcription factors that had increased levels of epimutate, where the binding site um, had increased the levels of epimutations, that there seems to be some pattern there that uh, associate, associated those factors to, to a stress response. And indeed, when we do genontology on this set, uh, these are the types of um, uh, uh, terms that uh, come that pop up. Uh, it's often it's a cellular response to extracellular stimuli, for example, or response to steroid hormones, suggesting that stress stress response uh, related transcription factors increase there, binding are, are more susceptible to binding site uh, to binding site epimutations. Inspired by the reviewers, but also because um, uh, we independently wanted to understand whether this was a real effect, we then took uh, cells from two patient-derived uh, uh, neurospheres, both IDH wild type, and exposed them to different stress factors amongst others, hypoxia. So we cultured cells from two different patients uh, under hypoxic conditions. And then following the exposure, we cultured uh, we, um, and we, we took cells after three days of hypoxia and cells after nine days of hypoxia, and then performed a bulk RRBS to infer DNA methylation profile, as well as single cell RNA sequencing. These are the results of the, of the, uh, uh, the RRBS experiment. Um, after three days, we actually do not find that hypoxia uh, re uh, results in an increase in epimutations, as is shown here on the left. And that's true for both cell lines. You'll appreciate that there's no significant p-values after three days. However, after nine days of culturing in hypoxic conditions, we can indeed, fi indeed find that the epimutation rate is increased, uh, demonstrating more directly that a stress, that cellular stress associates with an increase in epimutations. We then uh, generated uh, single cell transcriptomes, again, both after three days and after nine days, to understand whether epimutations directly govern the process of cell state, the cell state transitions. Um, after three days, and again, this is for the two cell lines, the three days on the left and nine days on the right. After three days, we actually already see that there's a state, there's a cell state transition. After three days of hypoxic culturing, cell states have already shifted more towards this differentiated, differentiated like group. Um, even though we did not yet find at that time point that there was an increase in epimutations. Um, this cell state transition pattern was maintained after nine days, suggesting that epimutations may actually serve to stabilize these cell state transitions rather than directly modulating them. With the, ex with the exact same data set, we repeated the analysis using Mario Suva's and Neftel cell states and find that uh, uh, hypoxia results in an increase in the mesenchymal-like uh, cell state. So to conclude the second and final part, tumor progression and treatment response are multifactorial, are multifactorial and heter heterogeneous processes. Treatment drives genomic changes in some tumors like hypermutation and radiation-induced small deletion phenotype. But in others, it may be more epigenetic uh, and there's probably even more mechanisms beyond that. Um, we need to understand what determines those, which, in which tumors there's gonna be a genetic response versus which tumors there's gonna be a non-genetic response. We show, I hope I convince you, that epigenetic mechanisms contribute to the adaptive responses that stress indeed creates epigenetic changes, as well as results in different cell states. And in the end, careful dissection of glioma tumor cell and microenvironment interactions is needed to complete our understanding of growth patterns and tumor behavior. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people that did the hard work. Um, I wanna highlight Emre Kutagavuk over here, who together with Flores uh, led the uh, small deletion phenotype uh, analysis of the GLASS data set. Fred Barn is leading the uh, creation of the second class data re uh, release, uh, but is also going to be um, is also leading the analysis of the microenvironment and the changes in the microenvironment over time. I didn't have time to talk about that much today. And then the two Kevins, Kevin Johnson and Kevin Anderson, led the single cell analysis that I described to you as well. And of course, I'd like to thank our funders. <laughs>
And I'll stick around to answer any questions in the chat. And again, I'd like to thank Bjorn and Nancy Ann for putting together this wonderful event. Thank you very much. Thank you.